Hey everybody, hope you're doing well today. So in this video, I wanted to talk about Charlie Puth and uh, his new album Voice Notes and what exactly makes Charlie's song sound so Charlie. So if you're interested, let's dive right into it. I've got a whole bunch of examples here just to show you some of the, uh, some of the devices that Charlie uses. Um, and so a lot of this is theory based. Actually, all of it is talking about the music theory of um, some of the stuff he does in his music. So let's let's get right into it. First of all, if you want your songs to sound like Charlie, you've got to use lots of chords that are not just minor and major. So he uses a lot of seventh chords, you know, like major um, major sevenths, minor sevenths, dominant sevenths. He uses extended chords like nines, elevenths, thirteenths, like all that jazz stuff because you know he was a graduate at the Berklee College of Music in the United States. So. Um, he's very well versed in, in just the jazz style of, of playing piano. So that, that's kind of the general overview of, uh, of how Charlie works. A lot of his music is not just major and minor. You've got to have all those complex chords in there to make it sound awesome. So let's start with the first example. This is um, this is change one of the things in there. Don't we know everyone's got a father and mother? The day we know we're all the same together, we can make that change. Now, when he sang together, uh, let me just play that actually. Did you get that little bit of uplifting sensation? Because like. Here, let me listen to it one more time. Don't we know everyone's this is all very nice. And mother, the day we know we're all the same together, we can make that change. So when he sings together, together we can make the change. We personally get that uh, feeling of, whoa, something interesting just happened. You know, it's it's not very traditional anymore. Like there's another new layer introduced musically. And what that is, it's called the secondary dominant. And what that is, is uh, essentially, this piece is, or this song is in E major, right? And we have the note A in E major. It's the fourth note in E major scale. So what he does in together, he actually brings in an A sharp. So instead of A, we have A sharp. And that's the, like the foreign sharp, that we don't have an E major, when he brings it in, that kind of sparks our interest. And we're just like, wow, what is that beautiful chord, right? So. And the reason why it's called a secondary dominant is uh, basically because the, the final chord in this uh, pre-chorus, I, I guess this is the pre-chorus. We can make that change. It's like a B chord, right? And so B major is the dominant or the five chord of E major. So that makes a lot of sense, you know? We're ending a section with the dominant and we want to go back to the tonic. Um, in this case, it goes back to the subdominant A major, but forget that. So we have B major and he actually sets that up with the dominant of B major, which is F sharp. So he pulls in an F sharp seven chord which has this A sharp, mind you, right? Then he resolves it to the B, and then he resolves it again, not to E major, but this time to A major. So a, a secondary dominant is essentially you're taking the dominant of another chord in the song, and that chord, this new chord, has that um, foreign quality to it because we don't have that extra note in the original scale, okay? It might sound a little confusing, but the idea is he's introducing a foreign note into the song that we haven't heard before. In this case, it's not A, it's A sharp. Okay, so that's really cool. I think he does this in other songs as well, um, but uh, this is the first one that kind of came to mind. So let's talk about the second one. We have chromaticism, and this is awesome. Let me just play this for you. All right, so aside from this intro being produced wonderfully and uh, the vocal air is just sounding so warm and luscious, you get the sensation of a descending feeling throughout the intro. And that's because the bass line descends chromatically. 
chromatically basically just means you're going through every single note on the piano. So B, B flat, A, A flat, G. So every single semitone, you're going down one by one, and he does this for a few notes. So he starts on B, he goes down, he goes down again, again, and one more time. Now he's on the four chord of G major. Now he's doing a minor four, by the way, and then he'll go to the five to one. So this, this uh, kind of progression, this descending chromaticism gives the opportunity for the, uh, the other chords just to be as exploratory as possible and it lets him have as much fun as he wants essentially with this intro while having a steady bass line that just goes down little by little every time we don't expect that and we definitely don't expect that and now this is the kicker and now we return back to the tonic okay of d major there so that's really cool. Let's let's see this other example here. It doesn't have to end this way. Right, so there. In this way. Right there. He could have just done in this way. Dun, 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 but that would be pretty boring without that extra chord in there. So this time he ascended chromatically. He went from A to A sharp to be in the bass, okay? And the in, in the right hand, he went from an A chord to a diminished chord. So now we really want to resolve and we get that resolution with the B minor chord that follows it. So that's awesome. Um, and that actually takes me right into the transitional chords because he does a lot of chords in between sections or while he's taking a break from singing. And a lot of pop music nowadays doesn't do that. It just has a single chord, and then the next section comes in with a new chord. But what Charlie Puth does a lot is he'll sing his last chord, but then a new chord will pop in just before the new chord of the new section. So let me just play a little bit of that. Um, and this is actually the same example as this one right here that I just played. It doesn't have to end this way. Right, so there you go. That that's an instant lift into the pre-chorus. So that's pretty cool. Uh, let's see this other example here. Yeah, so there he could have just said, in my world. Right, he didn't have to do any other chords following the world chord. But there again, we get these transition chords that set us up even more for the return of the, uh, or for the second half of the pre-chorus. So what he does is, in a mold. let's see. Right, so the right hand goes chromatically down. Dun, dun, dun. And the left hand just kind of does like this cool, this two five one, which is basically the foundation of jazz. So he com he combines chromaticism with two five one, which gives you this really just. I can't really describe it. It's an awesome feeling. <laughs> um, and then here we have how long in the pre-chorus. Right, so that little extra chord. Um, sorry, let me go back to the piano. So that chord right there. After this chord, he could have just got went to there right afterwards, but he didn't. He actually threw in this little right there. And that itself is kind of a two, five, one. Two, five, one, right? So, he, you know, he uses traditional jazz devices a lot in his music, and this is just one of those. It sounds really cool because it's technically, it's a diminished chord over the C sharp. So it's B diminished over a D flat. And as you can see there, they notated it as D flat seven um, with a flat nine. I'm not a jazz player myself, I'm classically trained, so 
these these um, types of notations don't jump out at me immediately. But anyway, let's keep going. Another thing I notice is that he has really refreshing cadences and uh, one specific thing he does, I'll talk about that in just a sec. So let's hear the first example. Baby, if you leave me now. Let's hear the next one. So one thing in common of all these progressions or all these cadences is that it's a very retro um, and old, in a good way, good sounding uh, cadence. You don't have just the traditional 5-1. You actually have that kind of thing. So what exactly is that? Basically, um, the left hand is doing the 5-1. So let's say we're in the key of D major. And the 5 chord would typically be A major, right? Going back to D major, which is the 1. But what Charlie does a lot is he'll actually put, uh, play the subdominant chord, which is the 4 chord in the right hand. And then he puts that over the dominant note in the left hand. So instead of having an A7, he'll actually do a G chord over the A. So now you have an A7, 9, sus, 4. That's pretty sus. Um, so you have, instead of, yeah. That sounds very classical, but now he threw in. So now you get that instead of. Right, so it's, it's a kind of it's you know more jazzy. It's a subdominant over the dominant, and then here's the other example. Be, be Two five one there, but the point is, instead of doing that, sounds very classical, right? But if you do here, you it's in D flat major, so he has his G flat major chord um, over the A flat. Okay. And then in change, Break apart, we don't have to go that way. that's another Break awesome thing. Yeah, so here, this is the other, like another example of him using the um, subdominant chord over the, the dominant note. Instead of, he goes. Okay. And finally, uh, just to show you how versatile and how creative Charlie really is, he actually uses, uh, actually, you know what, let me just play it. So if you notice, none of these chords actually sound completely satisfying. And that's because he, like all of these are not just major or minor chords. There's an augmented chord in there. There's um, uh, seventh chords in there. So let's just go through the chords one by one. He starts with a B minor seven. If I can have my piano play, right? Instead of just B minor, it's kind of traditional, but he throws in the A, so that's B minor seven, and then, B minor over G sharp, right? Um, and then, then it's, so it's G major seven with a nine. Um, and basically what that is, is a B minor chord. So B minor seven with a G on the bottom. Okay, and then, then this is a, so B, E, F sharp. So B sus four with the C sharp on the bottom. And then here's the augmented chord right here. Right? And that is an F sharp augmented chord, or you could say um, B sharp augmented. They're, they're basically the same. And the reason the augmented chord is so effective is that uh, it gives kind of a tension feeling, right? And so um, instead of it just being happy or sad, it makes you anticipate what's coming up next. 
Um, augmented chords and diminished chords both give a sense of tension. Like this is an augmented chord. And then we want to resolve. Diminished chords also want to resolve. So they, they both qualities make you want to go back to something comforting. And that's exactly what he does here. Typically, typically we'll use um, augmented chords or diminished chords to uh, <clears throat> to lead into another section or you know display a repetition of a chord progression as he does here. So one more time, I'll just play it. back into it. So with that augmented chord there, we are like, oh, we feel tension and we need to feel resolved. We need to feel satisfied. And so he gives that back to us with the B minor seven chord, which is a relatively comfortable chord. Nothing offending about that, okay? But essentially that, those are just a few things that I found awesome about uh, Charlie Puth's music. These are a few devices he consistently uses, especially in his first album when he was still finding a sound. Um, now that he's refined a lot of his um, style, these devices still appear a lot, but not quite as much. But you know what? If you want your music to sound like him, then give these a try. Every song of his, or sorry, I should say most songs of him, um, combine at least one or two of these devices. So give these, give these a whirl, and uh, I'd be interested to know the results you come up with. So you can link those to me in the comments below or uh, send me a personal message. I'd love to hear it. Um, in any case, thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think of this new album. If you love it as much as I do, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. I'll see you in the next video.